Uh, yeah, hello there, people. So, uh, welcome to everyone who's here. Also, those who are eventually to arrive. Uh, so yeah, this is a lecture on sacrificing stones. Yeah, that's I guess a good introduction. I I won't start exactly with the like premise just yet. I'm gonna start with an example because there's always with every NGD lecture I do. There's, there's something that triggers me to do it. Like something happens and I say, well, I really, really, really want to talk about this, you know? Uh, you know, students games, you know, one of my own games, something I've been thinking about. I, I get triggered to talk about certain subjects. Uh, hello there, everyone. Uh, Padu Giza, Tatesin, um, Marskol. Oh, and Lei, Lei is here. Yeah, welcome everyone. So. The I wanted first to show a game, or the beginning of a game, and uh, discuss it a little bit just from a normal Go perspective. A Korean proverb, sacrifice any group with less than seven stones. That's an interesting one. I have a slightly different take, I guess. Um, oh, Random Chess Addict. That's a good name for a Go stream. So, okay, I'm going to start by showing you guys a position. So this is this is how we're we're gonna uh, kick off. Let's see, move twenty four. Okay. So this position, ignore Black's wonky opening. Like that's probably you know maybe a computer won't like that. You know some weird stone around G seventeen, etc. But the question I have for you guys is, who do you prefer here? Or rather, oh, can can be sacrificed. Yeah, just a snap judgment. Who do you prefer in this position? It's an even amount of moves, so it's box turn. And I was wondering what instinct is as to who is favored. Now, of course, White has died with some stones, right? Which is why we're going to talk about this. Um, and. The position's kind of dynamic in that sense. I prefer white. Okay, someone prefers white. Hmm, I think there are certain things to consider here. So for one, capturing stones is nice. They're points, right? Uh, this was black's corner. We can notice that white, you know, well, white has two stones, black has two stones. So this is on the top right corner. We have an even amount of moves. That's something we can consider also. And black did capture some stones. White has some other advantages we can consider. Um, points are poison, says Jeff. Yeah, yeah. Well, points are poison is an interesting one. I, I think points, for me, for example, points aren't poison. I don't appreciate points enough, I think. But many people like over appreciate them, I think. So let's check the order of moves for this position because i think i think often at least when i judge positions it's much easier to make a judgment when i see the order of moves so uh let's let's go back and okay uh this this game uh is between two three down players one of them is my student and uh you know he likes playing this kind of g17 c15 enclosure uh, I'm not responsible for that. And uh, they got into this fighting Joseki where white had these two stones, which they kind of ended up sacrificing. So here, I think maybe at this point, white decided to let them go. Black captured, white plays this exchange, white gets to move on the outside, and it's black's turn. And... One of the reasons I wanted to lecture on sacrificing stones was that the two players involved in this game are, you know, relatively high level players. They're, um, you know, three done. And when I talked to my student, he significantly liked Black's position here. You know, because he was like, well, I, I got four stones. I got my points. I have a nice position. I mean, this is easy to play for me. And uh, I think his opponent agreed with him judging by how they played a little bit later in the game and you know at the time i wasn't so sure 
let's consider. So, these stones died. But, what the argument I made to my student, which is not exactly related to stones, is that this is Sente, right? R16 is key for both players. Yes, yes, I actually suggested this to my student, so my student Tenukid, and I said, actually, I think you should just go ahead and gobble up this stone. Uh, because now you're creating a cutting point in white's shape, which is going to be really annoying later. And also, if you don't do anything, then white's going to play R16, which means you have to defend, which means that later this is going to be Sente. So it's just a huge amount of points and strength and, you know, just... Um, I thought it's a big deal. So I, I recommended that. Uh, I think white should also have played R16. And the argument I made to my student for why this position isn't clearly better for black is that after we play R16, eventually T17 is going to come. And T17 isn't strictly speaking sente, but it's going to be really annoying otherwise. Like, it's going to be it's going to be your points turning into eight, you know? Like, white has more points with... Oh, no, no, not like this. White has more points with Komi than black in the entire corner. And then the other thing that I wanted to point out to my student was how these stones are crippling black on the outside. Because white has a lot of um, a lot of options on the outside. So notice that black has four stones, but white has a lot of seemingly ancillary advantages that add up to a very decent position. So I was like, I'd rather take white. Now, um, I checked the computer just to make sure the position's actually exactly even. Like this position is, if white gets R16 and Sente, the position is exactly even. Which I found interesting. I'd rather take white. White has a lot of Aji to use for later. Yes, exactly. So this is what we're going to talk about. Dead stones don't mean that the stones are useless. I think this is one of the really important things. So why do we dislike dying with stones? Uh, I get black 1.5 ahead in this corner. Really? Oh, I think, so uh, Anti, Anti in chat is saying that black is ahead, and I seem to remember checking it, and that it was exactly 50-50 percentage-wise. Doesn't matter for humans, okay. But I, that surprised, is it if black gets at R16? Like, I thought that if white gets R16, then it's completely even. Okay, it's exactly even because G17 is terrible. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, 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 true. The position is even because G17, the corner is slightly better for black, yes, that's true. Yeah, I mean, my student likes these openings. I, I let him do, I mean, I, he can do whatever he wants, but uh, I don't mind them too much. Um, wait, G17's minus two points? This is off topic for the lecture, but that's amazing. Minus two points, G17, it's that bad. I don't think my student will care, but I'll mention it to him. So, okay. The key point from earlier is that the stones of white are dead, but they're not useless. And that's a really important distinction to make. The reason that we put stones on the board is that they do stuff, you know, like they get us points, they get us certain objectives in the game. Well, eventually it's all about points, but you know, there's many other, m many mediums to getting points and that, that's what stones are there for. They're there to control the board. So, you know, we're taught to value our stones because if they die, it's like, or it, they're actually one more stone in our opponent's territory, you know, one more point. So that doesn't sound very fun. You'd, you'd, rather, you'd rather be using your stone and not your opponent be using your move. As we get a little bit stronger, we're taught to like sacrifice single stones and to not hang on too much to like small groups of stones uh, in order to gain other advantages, right? It's bad to die with stones, but in Go, it's all about like sometimes you have to do bad things so your opponent does worse things and then you're better, you know? So we're taught that we can sacrifice stones in given situations or other advantages, but in my experience, people still have this inherent bias where they really, really, really like stones. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a specific bias towards capturing stones. 
And I don't think that's an unfair bias. I think it has its uses. But it can also be very misleading because the association between stones dying and stones becoming useless is a very important one. I feel like my 4K brain can recognize this white advantage or sacrificing, but I feel like it's nearly impossible to see this during my own play. Well, yeah, so it's very easy to see... It, it's very easy to see how these four stones are dead, right? And it's much harder to visualize... It's much harder to visualize how white's going to use this later, right? I think it takes a lot of experience to see, well, this weakness of blacks is crippling on the outside, you know? Actually, when I was talking to my student about this game, my first instinct was to play R16, and my second instinct is to play N15, just to fix the weakness, you know? So, you know, black, black has a problem, which later became an issue. Uh, and uh, actually, we can illustrate how that weakness became useful for white by showing the game. So I think I read that the willingness to sacrifice stones correlates with level. R16 is extremely delicious. Yes, yes, uh, su supremely delicious. I agree. R16, playing R16 is gote, but it's so big. It's so big. This stone, capturing this stone, I know it's one stone and I'm talking about sacrificing stones. But this stone at B is really huge, really huge. And the reason is it's reverse sente. It creates a cutting point at A, right? It means you never have to play this dame at C ever again. It means white's never getting this end game, right? It's so delicious. I agree. It's beautiful. So R16, I can't resist playing it. Just really big, um, which is interesting because I'm just talking about how white can sacrifice four stones. But in fact, black can capture this stone at S16. Now, one of the big differences is that when black captures this stone at S16, it's gone forever. This stone at S16 is off the board. And that's very important to keep in mind. Something I've told some of my students before is that dying with stones isn't such a big deal. You just don't want them to die in Ponuki. Like, of course, there is exceptions, right? But dying in Ponuki is much, 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 much worse than just dying with stones. Because a dead group of stones still has infinite uses very often. Whereas stones that are off the board are literally just extra komi for your opponent. So that's, you know, this position is like, even though Black's playing inside his own territory, this position is much, much, much better for Black than this position much better so um i have a demo board on ojs called appreciating influence positions where i see the player with points to be ahead or actually one with the influence and sent is ahead according to ai well yeah points one of the reasons that we like capturing stones is that they're free points so it's another um factor that we like points too much usually so um Okay, so my student kind of liked black here, and uh, his opponent, I think, also liked black. And I think the game kind of shows why, so we're going to play quickly through the game. And uh, the game itself, I interestingly, in this fight, uh, my student became kind of handicapped by the weakness of these two stones, because white had the cutting point, which meant white had a lot of agency in the fight. like. White can just play this honey and not care because everything is secretly sent to, against Black's weaker shape. Um, white didn't play everything perfectly, but uh, in general, White got White got a nicer result on the outside because of this um, than you would maybe expect. And the more interesting like occurrence in this game, I thought, was a little bit later in the game. So my student invaded the lower left corner and then started this cutting fight and then did his very, very best to murder these three stones. So again, we're going to talk about sacrifices. So this was a game where sacrifices were very topical and why I ended up doing this, uh, this lecture in a way. I wonder how much damage the Atari Go tutorial has done to our Western brains to learn never die, dying is bad. I mean, I... I guess 
beginners do have this tendency to save stones, but we don't... I, I think we learn to get past that. I think sacrificing single stones is is usually possible for many people. But the bigger the groups get, the harder it is. Like people, like for example, dying with groups is something a lot of people struggle with and it's an inherent bias. And we're going to talk about that. So, um, yeah. Okay, so... Notice that white stones here are kind of dying, they're kind of enclosed, but there's a lot of Aji, right? Here, here, here. White is cut. You know, white, it, let's say hypothetically white extends, black captures, white nets. White's captured, but this is the type of situation where I don't think you would mind getting captured too much because ultimately you're going to have all of these moves in Sente, which means you have a very strong wall. Black did take Sente, but black is capturing a small area. I'm not going to say this is good for white, but even the bare minimum, even if you just sacrifice in the simplest way possible, white's not getting a bad result, you know? Um, now, the reason I bring this up was that after white played h2 and black played h3, white did something kind of shocking. Uh, they resigned. They resigned this game. And three down level. Right, so I was astounded, like, you know, resigning, I mean, first of all, don't resign, but, you know, as far as I could tell what happened to white, and, you know, I'm guessing because white isn't my student, black is, but to me, it looks like white died once, white died twice, and then white was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I don't, you know, um, I, I don't think I have a chance in this game anymore, you know, so... And this is kind of significant to me because at this very moment, I was telling, you know, my student, whoever plays M14, right, whoever plays M14 is actually ahead in this game, in my opinion. So let's say here, we play M14, black has to take, white connects. Notice that you're going to get this Atari very soon. Okay, black will probably exchange here. And white's going to get this Atari and then something like this. And then these stones are going to eventually, eventually, right, have to capture white's four. And then white's going to get all of these moves on the outside. White has a super thick, um, well, the lower size is actually small compared to this. So what I was telling my student was like, you know, when the AI has that one move they really want to play and screaming to play it, I was like, please, someone play here, please, you know? So for me, I was guessing that whoever plays this move is actually favorable. But this somewhat, you know, I mean, it's an important discussion, but it's not like living the three stones is the only way you can get a good position. But after dying with these stones, white resigned. And that's why I thought this was an interesting example where white died once, white died twice, both times with very reasonable uh, counterplay. So here, I don't think this is a bad result for white. I think it's perfectly fine. And, you know, wh white just threw in the towel, you know? So, um, so nobody, even then you may have a bias to think that dying is bad. That's kind of good for complete beginners, but I wonder if that carries over to the SDK level un um, un subconsciously. Well, yeah, I think, I think that it carries over to the down level subconsciously to the very high level subconsciously. Nobody ever won by resigning. Yeah, I mean, I have to say that white resigned isn't necessarily the point here. I mean, no matter how bad the position you think it, it, it like you think the position is, a move 90 probably resigning isn't the most uh, smart thing to do in terms of winning, because then you lose, right? But I think the important thing here is that white thought the game was resignable, and black actually also thought the game was very good for him. My student, you know, uh, really, really like the game for black because, you know, he won both the fights by capturing white stones, right? Um, the easiest kind of sacrifice for me is to probe before a real invasion. There are light stones that are not meant to live. That's a, another important one. When people invade, they're afraid of dying, right? Which isn't necessarily the best way to think about it because if you die while you're invading, you lo lost nothing often. So that's another interesting one. The stones are light. Okay, so this was the example that, to me, 
like sort of triggered this discussion. And I think the really important thing we need to understand when we sacrifice stones like this, because of course, dying with four stones in such a way, you know, shouldn't be good on paper. I mean, you're, you're taking four moves that you played and letting your opponent capture them, right? Which, which doesn't, it's not a good look, but it's all about how you can, let's say, milk the existence of the stones afterwards. And that's why there's a big difference between dead stones you can use and dead stones you can't use. The best sacrifices generally find a very resourceful way to use the stones. So, okay. Uh, let's check a second example. And this one's actually from my own game. It's a very recent game against uh, Lucan Nering. He's, you know, uh, I'm going to say... Like, yeah, he's about my rating. So he's, you know, average six ton, six ton. And I was black. Oh, this was during the, the transatlantic league, pro league qualification. And uh, we got this corner position, which I thought was kind of interesting because of how I judged it versus, like how I judged it during the game versus how I judged it after the game. Okay, I'm black. And I want to talk about this corner on the top right. Now, notice that white has three stones on the rest of the board. Black has two stones. Therefore, I mean, it is black's turn. But black has one more stone on the top right area. Uh, black has sente, if, if he so chooses. Uh, full disclosure, this isn't a ponoki of white's. Black didn't have a stone there ever. So it's not like I, I lost a stone there. If you count, you know, white has not taken any of my stones off the board yet. I'd be curious what people's instincts are on this position. Uh, because I had an instinct and it wasn't entirely correct. Um, so my logic at the time was that my position on the outside looks pretty solid. I have Sente. And I'm often a sucker for influence, so I have uh, I have that uh, that type of tendency. Mm. N N thirteen Honte. Oh, N thirteen Honte is an interesting one. I feel like black must be good, but I don't know how to play forward with that kind of influence. Probably white's better according to AI. Okay, interesting. Oh, hello, uh, uh, Sil Sil Hver. So, oh, I think what we want to talk about here is these two stones. So we can notice that they're, you know, they're kind of dead, and by kind of I mean very. But probably we want to look at the. Pro probably we want to look at the move order to see how these stones were used. Obviously, they're not very useful anymore, but we want to talk about how useful they were beforehand. Right? Because in principle, it shouldn't be good to just die with two stones like that, you know? And oh, we also have to talk about this stone, which is probably not optimally placed for white. But okay, let's look at the move order. Uh, the one thing I found out in these situations, instinct isn't that useful. Raw logical analysis works much better. Yeah, yeah, this is one very uh, good point that, uh, that Anti makes. One of the issues with sacrificing stones is that our instinct or our intuition is vastly skewed towards the like the side where we die with stones. Like whoever kills the stones, we generally like them more. It's not always the case, but there's these huge biases, um, not just about capturing stones, but many others that make our judgment really, really, really um, questionable at times. So instinct is quite dangerous. Instinct didn't work for me here. I, I made some bad decisions. So let's look at the move order. Mm. So are we going to have a discussion how to analyze these positions or would that be a whole another lecture? Well, the idea here is that we're going to look at positions where we're sacrificing stones or groups and discuss how the dying of stones could like mess up our intuition at times uh, and when we should value our stones and when we shouldn't. So. A, a Tewari lecture does sound interesting, though, where you're just trying to, as as exactly as possible, break down a position uh, into logical analysis. 
how are you is, you know, very nice. In fact, later in this lecture, I have an example where I died with a bunch of stones, and the way I rationalized it, like, well, the way I, I decided that it was okay was through Tewari analysis during the game. So, okay. So, this is how the sequence happened. Uh, this so far is kind of a Joseki, and what happened here to me was that I figured if I Hane, White's gonna have a really hard time breaking out because of this shortage of liberties, White's going to have to connect at Q17, which means I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to get to enclose White. So I thought, oh, White has to play this really dumb looking move at P15. You know, I mean, why, why would you do that? It's like the emptiest triangle in history, you know? Uh, so I was like, haha, you're going to play this empty triangle. And then I double Hane and I'm like, oh, oh, yes, you're going to have to connect here and in Dami at Q15. Uh, and then I, I thought, well, I'm I'm also going to to like use my two stones to get, you know, more profit on the outside. Now of course I'm I'm exaggerating. I didn't think this was good for me. I just thought it was okay. Um but that was sort of my logic. I was like, I died with the two stones. I died with the two stones, but I sort of made white play inefficient moves for it. Now, the reason that this logic isn't very good, let's say, is that my two stones are never going to do anything ever again. I think that's the important thing to notice. So go is often a discussion of stone efficiency. So when your dead stones actually don't have any purpose, that's dangerous. You know, uh, O18 hurts. Well, O18 hurts. I mean, black black has some inefficiency on the outside. I mean, look at the stone at B. Uh, I mean, of course, white stones over here are not exactly very useful either. Uh, but uh, like this, this is the type of position that's hard for me to understand because all of the stones are so inefficient. Like, there's there's no stone that's good here. Everything sucks for everyone. But um, yeah, another thing that happened to me was that I really underestimated the value of O14. So this stone of whites is arguably kind of dead. I think it's more likely that it's going to die than that it's going to live. Much more likely. Because black can just kill it any time, and for the time being, white's probably not going to be like in a huge hurry to, to pull out the stone. I don't think this is getting white anything except maybe a weak group. It, it's okay, but I don't think white's in a hurry to do so. And it is Black's turn. Black could fix if he wants to, and I don't think it's even a bad move. However, the stone getting killed eventually, it has, like, it, it doesn't mean it's not useful. This stone at 014 creates a cutting point, which is very useful for white later in the game. My two stones at R16, R15 are never doing anything ever again. Okay, that, that's an exaggeration. Interestingly, later in the game, I played S13 in Endgame, and then I played this in Endgame, which gives me delicious Endgame. Really delicious Endgame. This is very fun. So if white blocks, then I actually kill white. So white has to... White has to play this way and allow me to jump here. But that's... That's like a kind of maybe sort of. That's if I go down at S13, and if white doesn't Hanya at T13, Right, and if then white doesn't play p nine, you know, I it's, it's you know, very very small bonus for having those stones. What happens in your head if you remove q sixteen? Let's try it. Q sixteen r sixteen r r fifteen q fifteen. Oh, that's an interesting one. That's an interesting one. I think. So if we're, if we're gonna take some uh, try and do a little bit more Tewari here. This looks to have them as better for white. Yes, to have them as better for white. This this does look nice for white. I think having the exchanges is nice for white, but only a little bit nice for white. I think it's the difference is really small between having them and not having them. But this looks amazing for white. Yes, if you look at it this way, it's just very nice. I think the main reason might be. This kind of looks like this situation, kind of, where this is probably sort of reasonable 
because white takes some corner, black takes the outside. Uh, notice the the amount of stones here should be the same for. Yeah, this amount of stones here should be the same. But I've I've done a little bit of a like mean trick here. When I changed the the amount of stones here, I I took off like black actually has extra stones here, which isn't good. Like black has an extra stone compared to the situation I I said I thought was acceptable for black. So black's really inefficient here. Yeah. So Auntie's right. The value of S13. The value of S13 is higher. Yes. Yes. But the difference. How big should the difference be? I I don't think it's more than a couple of points or so. But yeah. Anyway, Auntie's point stands. You know, this situation is much better for white, not this one, but this one. That, there, that you know. A and then you add these exchanges which do favor white, so. Yeah, so th this is how you can kind of get around some biases, right? But it's really hard, right? It's really time consuming. In tournament play especially, it's really hard to do this kind of analysis. In, in my game, I just kind of felt like taking Moyo because, I don't know, I, I felt like it. And uh, I played some sequence that keeps my stones together and gives me some abstract stuff on the outside and looked kind of good. But I made two of my stones on the board kind of impotent. The conclusion is that white's better here. Yes, white's much better. And the reason is that these two stones are not doing anything. Like, they're not doing almost anything, let's say. Uh, whereas white's is. And I kind of... I think the main problem I had this game was that I really, really underestimated O14. Because, okay, I can kill it, but that takes me a move. So the existence of this stone, even if it dies, is very high for white. Right? It doesn't matter if it dies or not, let's put it that way. If this is better than flying knife trade of corner. Yeah, it should be better. Hello, Vidomina. So... Interestingly, here I had the the opposite. I had the wrong instinct. Like, uh, very often people don't want to just sacrifice these two stones. I did so too willingly. And uh, I, I, I guess in retrospect, the main reason is that they're just completely impotent. These stones are never doing anything ever. And that's um, important to consider when you die with stones. Um, so, okay. The next example is probably my favorite. It's from a recent game of mine, and it's one where my judgment was, for a change, really good, I think. For a change. Um, so let's see. This game was against... Uh, this game was against uh, Javier uh, Savolainen. Uh, maybe some Finnish people in the chat have heard of him. He's a strong 5 run, almost 6 run rated recently player. So can we moderate... I think we can moderate it, yes. Uh, yeah, let's ban him. Yep. Um, okay, so in this game, I'm black, and I... Okay, let's just go through the game quickly, and I want to talk about this group of stones. And this group of stones is one I really like to play with, because very often I get to sacrifice it. Very often. And I sort of enjoy that. White pincered. G17. I pincered back and I'm already sort of preparing to sacrifice eventually. And then... White eventually plays J16. Which is sort of saying... I want this to happen. And probably I want this to happen. And probably I want to... I, I want to try and swallow the stones big. I'm guessing that's what White wanted to do, ideally. Or, you know, alternately, if Black pulls back, just pull out the stones. This is a very awkward group for Black to handle because you don't have eyes. You can't sell locally. You don't really want to run with it. So White's trying to make it awkward. Like, if White, if White just directly tried to kill, I don't care as much as, as if White tries to swallow big. Um... Oh, hello, Najay. Uh, w welcome. Mm -hmm. So, I bumped, and I should have pushed. 
But actually, the reason I didn't push is that I figured that if I push, then these stones are never going to be useful ever. Like, or not never, they're still useful. For example, they're going to give me this endgame incente, which is, you know, valuable. But I wanted to maximize my use by playing this Hane instead. So it's a little bit harder for White to capture these uh, easily. Uh, it's not a good decision, but that's why I did it. And it's kind of topical because we're, I'm looking at how to maximize the use of these stones. Remember that when I play this Joseki as black, I'm uniformly looking to sack these. Like, not, not uniformly, I, very, I, I can save them, but I've usually found it's easier to sacrifice them than to save them in this Joseki. I don't like black if, if you try to save them, so uh, that's a personal preference thing. Oh, and Tateson's also in the chat, welcome. Now, white played f14, and I mean, I've already been talking about this sacrifice, and obviously I don't mind it, you know? I've been talking about that I like sacrificing this group. I, I don't I don't think it's a bad position for Black. But I would ask the chat what they think. Because here, Black is dead. Undoubtedly, Black is dead with these stones. And, I, I, you know, the, the compensation here for Black isn't absolutely clear in certain ways. And I'd be very interested in seeing what people think about this one. I check the original position and anti-suggestion of removing two stones in the upper right with AI. Give it a 5% better evaluation for black if the moves were removed. Yes, I see. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I, I agree, I agree. It's, um, it does make the position better for black. Talking about the previous position we were discussing. Uh, Barukiza says, so that's why I have big troubles with this Joseki. 100% of the games I wanted to save the group. Yeah, so saving the group is okay. So you can, but I would say my, my personal experience is that if you want to save the group, you'd much rather add a move now. You'd much, much rather add a move now because once white pincers, it's really hard. I can't even find a local move that I like because if you play the normal one, then white's, white's just sort of harassing your group that's getting heavy. Like, at this point, I always find it much easier to sacrifice. If you want to save it, you should probably add a move immediately. So you're not as much uh, under pressure. But that's my personal opinion. I'm not sure if... That's from my experience of playing it. So, okay, back to the position at hand. Here. You did get to strengthen your upper right corner and middle. Yes. So, one piece of compensation that black gets is ultimately this end game. So the border, you know, I've gotten to expand my border on the middle and the top side. On the other hand, black isn't spectacularly efficient. This stone would rather be at B. A would rather be at B. So there's there's obviously some compensation for black for just dying with these stones. But I personally found it kind of hard to to evaluate this, and even though I'm sort of used to sacrificing in this in this Joseki, I I was still having trouble evaluating whether I'm getting enough compensation or not. So already a while ago, I made a Tewari. So we're gonna talk about Tewari. I think Tewari is a good way to get over um, qualms about sacrificing stones, because you know I still felt a little bit bad here. I wasn't sure if this position is okay for me or not. So. I decided to break the position down a bit, and hopefully that way I'm less biased. I think I was less biased, so. Okay, so my, my first thought was, let's take all of these exchanges off the board. I, this, isn't the, this is only the first step, not the final one. Let's take all of these stones off the board, and it's White's turn, right? I've taken four stones off for each player, it's White's turn. And white plays here. I mean, this this sequence on the on the top side looks kind of normal. I mean, the exchange of these triangle stones for these square stones is sort of a classic shape. Looks good for white, but f14 looks very slow. Well, of course. So if white played f14 here, you'd be like, "What are you doing?" I mean, this this move is doing nothing, right? It's very slow. You're already very strong, and etc. Right. Now. 
if the story was very simply that black just had two moves inside, I would like black. Oh, even in the original position. Oh yeah, F14 is slow. We're going to talk about that in a second. I didn't like his F14 move. Um, if we just imagine there's an even amount of moves for black and white on the inside, I think black would be an advantage because F14 is slow. Right? However, what happens here is that I actually play an extra move here. I play E17. So I died with an extra stone in white's territory, which already makes it a little bit harder to judge. And uh, to me, this this was slightly harder. Like It was very hard to judge because, of course, my extra move at E17 is not useless because it's going to give me this G18 endgame, right? So it's kind of like, uh, the way I ended up deciding to treat it was like, imagine white played f14, and then I played this endgame, you know? That's how I ended up settling on the position. And I figured, well, f14 is slow, so g18. So I guess it's kind of even. I slightly liked white, but I, I guess it's kind of even. And uh, I think that's probably a reasonable judgment. Now, the reason I bring this position up is that with this type of Joseki, or also, um, I mean, there are certain other Josekis where some people get really scared of dying with the stones. Like, uh, I didn't mean, I didn't intend to bring up this example, but I think it's a good one all the same. It's, you know, some people like defending this group, some people like Tanuki, but I've seen some situations where people really mind getting attacked with this group because they get scared of, of dying with it. They're like, well, what if here this happens and it's dead? Or, oh, another good one, another good one people don't like is this. This one's a better example, actually. I changed my mind. This happened to me in a recent game where white tanukis and black plays here. And I remember um, probably when I was a single digit Q or done player, I felt really uncomfortable. Oh, sorry, the stone's usually here. I felt really uncomfortable here as white because it feels like I just died with the stone. Yeah, two space pincer, yeah, excuse me. So this type of situation where you put down a stone and you die with it, people feel really uncomfortable with. And I think one of the important things to consider is what your opponent did to kill the stone and how much use you can get out of the stone. For example, this stone isn't strictly speaking dead. You can still I live in the corner in assorted ways. There's a lot of Aji you can use. In this specific case, the Aji is a little bit more, a little bit more specific and like linear. You just get this honey eventually. It's probably not going to be more than that. And you get this end game. And then it's all about judging whether this move at A is worth more than this move at B. Sort of. Like not entirely, but that's you can sort of boil it down to that. And uh, during the game, it's, it is a tournament game, I, I thought about that, and I figured, okay, this is fine for black. And I like sacrificing stones like this, it's fun. So I went for it, and it is okay. Now, what white should have done here is, I, in my opinion, right, white should have tried to maximize the efficiency of his stones. So what I mean is that in this situation, like, if we consider the stones 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, these exchanges are probably a little bit good for black because white stones are not doing much at all and black stones are. Like, but then white, black eventually plays 7, and if the whole group dies, then 7 isn't a very good move. But white in the game played a move that isn't very good either. Like, on the empty board, you'd never think of F14. So if I were white, what I would do and I was I was actually scared of this in the game. I was scared of white K15. Okay, yeah, Zephodius suggests J14. I was scared of K15. And my reasoning was, well, I really don't want to pull out these stones because the moment that I live with them, right, this is something that happens with both territory and stones. When you try and live with a group, it's like a promise. You're promising that you're going to live. And that carries with it a lot of implications. So if I want to live with this group, then that means I have to give this endgame. And now I have a heavy group that I need to live with. 
that's like annoying and troublesome and expensive, you know? If I let white kill the, kill the stones, then hopefully I'm gonna make white spend a move, I'm gonna get Sente, and I'm gonna get G18 later. So the onus is on white to do something if I'm the one that's saying that I'm dying. So what I was a bit scared of was, oh wait, uh, here, oh no, uh, okay, here, white plays k15 and tries to swallow the stones whole. So eventually white's gonna, like, for example, just a sequence like this, and white's expanding and trying to kill my stones passively. And that I didn't like at all because if white's playing moves he would play anyway that are still efficient, then I just died with an extra stone, you know? Then, okay, I do get G G18 endgame, but I mean it's move 35. I don't want G18 endgame on move 35. I want something useful, you know? So that's what I was scared of. And this is good for white. The moment that white played, uh, played just F14, I, I was, you know, satisfied. And apparently the game is completely even, um, according to the computer. I slightly liked white still, um, but I, I thought it should be even. And uh, eventually, eventually, I, I had a lot of fun this game because I got to use these stones many, many times by over-concentrating white's shape over and over again. I think uh, later in the game, I got, I, I, I got to play, I got to play G14, uh, which was like an ecstasy-inducing moment, like forcing white to play F15 for G, G14. So the stones did become useful somehow um, in, in their own way. And uh, I think, so what I liked about this position is that white died, uh, sorry, black died with the stones, but the fact that they're still there had, you know, some, it, it had assorted uses during the game that you wouldn't expect, even though I died with one extra stone. So um, it wasn't, probably not the best decision the way that I sacrificed, uh, but not the worst one either. I should definitely have played I should definitely have played H16. Definitely. But oh well, that that's aside. That's aside the point. Um, let's move on. And okay, the next one I wanted to discuss. So so far we've discussed dying with small groups of stones. But now we're gonna graduate to groups, right? And, and groups I think that as we get stronger, we get kind of used to sacrificing groups of stones if we get something else in return. But it's much harder for people to die with groups, even though in a way, in a way, there's an argument to be made that dying with groups is easier. Hear, hear me out. So, so the reason, I, I just had this thought now, the reason dying with stones is bad, as we said, is that you don't get to use them anymore, right? If you die in Ponuki, right, your stone gets taken off the board, you're never going to use it ever again. It's never going to do anything for your position. It's just one more komi for the opponent. That doesn't happen when groups die. Like, when groups die, especially if they have a big eye, if they still, you know, if they're dead, but they have, like, eight liberties, right? Those are groups that are functionally speaking alive, you know? It's going to take the opponent so many moves to take them off the board that they can still be very useful even while dead. Which means that when you die with groups, their function still hasn't been erased in large part. And I, I, I've developed a terminology for my, like, that I use for myself when I think about this type of group. It's called the zombie group. So it's an undead group, I suppose. And there's a couple of, uh, you know, fun examples of zombie groups that I saw in recent games that uh, I thought would be interesting to show. Where you die with a lot of stones, but you still get a lot of use out of them. So, um, let's see, my next example, wait, which, which one was my next example? I think it's, yeah, okay, so brains, yes, undead groups, well, yeah, thank you, I guess some people like it. Um, my next game was a game I played for the uh, Globus Cup qualification. Like the European qualification, and I played it against uh, Askar Kuzainov, who's like three done. And he's a kid, he's probably no more than 12, and he, he's like a three done. So the kid's a monster. But uh, he's not that much of a monster yet. So I was able to win the game, uh, still. 
I won't be able to win the game in a few years, possibly. But uh, yeah, I think he's around 12. He's really strong. So yeah. But okay, let's take a look at the game. That was black. Um, oh, at Zichen, Mike came up with the same term independently. It's a really nice metaphor. Oh, nice. Yeah, I guess it's... I guess it's sort of natural to call it a zombie group. Schrodinger's group? Well, actually, Schrodinger's group is it's something else, actually, in a way. Or, I, I use the Schrodinger concept, which I don't understand at all, but I use it anyway. I use it for exchanges, like when you can make two exchanges that... You can make one or the other, but you choose to make neither, those are Schrodinger's exchanges. Because your opponent doesn't know which one you can have, so you have both simultaneously, in a way. Um, but Schrodinger's group, I've not used before. That might also be a good one. Um, so I'm black, and this is a 30 second Bioyomi game, so it's not the highest quality. Mm. I ran out my group, etc. And then, I mean, this is just a, a sort of normal running fight that stems from black playing F18. This position, or it, like this moment, is when the game gets interesting. White cut at G17. And then played h17 and j16. And this looks kind of crazy from white because he gave me the corner, right? He gave me his corner, which means that this group doesn't have any eye space, right? And okay, he has a group on the side, but that's probably not worth it. That's what one would think. Now, what's white's angle? Can anyone see what white's aiming at eventually? Like, what's, what's the catch at, at some point or another? Because white, white has a trick that makes all of what I said, like, not entirely true. Like a tactical trick, a reading trick. Sacrifice the stones. Okay, sacrificing these stones is hard. Yeah, e19, exactly, e19. So, uh, h11, oh, h11 is an interesting move. I think after I extend, he's, he still can't, like, capture my stones, unfortunately. Um, I don't think that there's a working net. But, exactly, lay is correct, e19 and attach. My group can locally be killed, right? And if I play d19, white attaches and I'm out of liberties. And, okay, I probably can run out this way, but the Aji is there. I can locally get killed, so I have to be careful, right? Uh, if I if I try to start with f19, then white Han is in the corner, and again we have the same story where I'm dying locally, right? And I, I have to run. So I think that's what he was aiming for. I think he saw this and he thought that I have to watch it, so like maybe a move like l16 is going to be his sente, right? Uh, I'm pretty sure that was his logic, and I was kind of happy about this because I was seeing I was I was seeing the seed, you know, I was I was already seeing the 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 makings of a nice zombie group that I'm gonna get. Um, now, the reason that this is probably okay for white-ish is that once white runs out and white doesn't kill immediately, so white just minds his own business and like, okay, we what we did was a little bit questionable, but that's aside the point. Let's say that white just kept doing his own thing, like Yatari's here and here and here and then jumps and the, the game continues. Eventually, because of this Aji, I'm going to be forced to prematurely live. Like, I'm going to be forced to play a move on the second line that lives a little bit earlier than I would usually want to. So in that sense, that debt that Black has incurred... Um, oh, hello, Longing Cat, incidentally. Um, that debt that Black has incurred is going to cost me a move eventually. So if I were white, that's what I would do. I would force Black to eventually have to defend, eventually. Um, but has to live without Aji for the rest of his life. Now, Askar, you know, right, he kills, and he was like, haha, I got him, probably. And um, so here, incidentally, this double Hane is really... I, I don't know why I played double Hane. Don't play double Hane as kids. Just extend, please. <sighs> okay, anyway. So, um, that's aside the topic. I'm just seeing the double Hane now and say, I played that? Ouch. I played that like a month ago. Ah, anyway. So, don't no, do not do that. Ever. No, not at home not anywhere. Don't do that anywhere. So, okay, this double hunt is a bit weird because it just helps white get out. 
Um, yeah, so the exchange AB sort of help, helps white go where he wants to go. And it creates a cutting point that I'm going to have to deal with later. So it's kind of like if I played here, I don't think I would turn now. Um, you're saying that I should just stop all double honey? I'm fine with that. Um, I'd say that double honey, don't double honey is a proverb that is... I'd say it's true most of the time. Like, it's it applies to most situations where you could double honey, you shouldn't. But it can be done. Like, there are situations where it's reasonable. So, it's... It's really, really contextual. Just people are attracted to double honeys more than they should be, let's say. Because after all, you're inducing a weakness and pushing from behind. So, yeah, uh, white has Atari as soon as black double honeys. White should Atari as soon as black double honeys. And then black has a problem that black needs to deal with, sort of. Like, it, even if you play here, this exchange is good for white because it gives you this Atari if you want it, it gives you some peeps. It just weakens black's shape for no reason. You know, white doesn't mind having a stone at A that helps white anyway. So just a bad exchange, I think. Okay, that's not important to the lecture though. White plays E19 now, so, you know, Asker pulls the trigger. Um, interestingly, he's probably, wait, probably the same name, right? Askar, Oscar. Anyway, so he, he pulls the trigger. He's like, I killed you. And here, I mean, I was having a little bit of fun here, I have to say, because I played D19, which is, like, not a good move, because an AI, I'm very sure an AI will, like, play this Atari and then play here or something and, and do something else. But I'm following human logic. He wants to kill me, I'll let him kill me, right? And then he's gonna play B19, of course. And now I have a zombie group. So this that that's that's where we get to have fun. Notice that if I play J19 and I, I Hane, which previously would have gotten my group out, right? White will clamp and then I'm I'm dying. Uh, not like this. I'm I'm you know, I'm dying. Was was your last exchange necessary? No, no, it's not. It's not necessary. And moreover, wh White doesn't need to answer it. White shouldn't answer it. I just thought he would because he wouldn't have started killing me if he's not going to finish killing me, right? This is a human thing. And I figured if I can get the exchange, it's good because it increases the liberty of these stones. So I might as well. Um. So, okay. Black can't live, right? Um, even if they will answer 100%, isn't it better to keep one more exchange? Oh, whom liberties. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I want, the, I want to make sure I have the liberties for those stones. Uh, it's not a big deal. You can probably get the exchange later, and it will be a better timing. But from a human perspective, humans won't suddenly change their minds and decide they don't want to kill you. So, it, you know, an opponent that wanted to kill me there will just give me the exchange and I'll get more liberties. So... Okay, uh, I decided, okay, I don't want to play h19 uh, dame and get killed, so instead I played l18. White played uh, g19. So already notice that this group of whites is actually a weak group, right? This is the point I want to stress if we go back. This group of whites isn't weak right now. Like, at this moment, this white group isn't weak. It's actually stronger than black's group in the middle. It has this move incentive if it wants it. It can jump, oh no, it can jump here. It has lots and lots of room to breathe. You know, it's a very strong group. And by killing my group, which isn't off the board yet, and this is the very important distinction, white doesn't, white hasn't killed it like this. If white killed like this, the game's over. You know? Over. Because white got a lot of points, and black got nothing, right? But the point is, because these stones are still on the board, they're going to get to be used. So white's going to be forced to play g19, and now, functionally, white has two weak groups. That's, I think that's the really important thing. Both a and b, functionally, are going to get attacked. Because white's not going to start... Oh, okay, white might start just taking liberties and killing the stones. But that's going to cost white points, because you're going to have to fill your own territory. 
And that's also going to cost you moves. So while white's playing in his own territory, I'm going to be getting profit. So unless white wants to take a significant loss, then black is going to have the time of his life attacking this group. I, I was so happy white killed me. I, I really mean it. I was so happy white killed me. So, oh, hello, Solomon's crown. Welcome back. Um, so, okay, I died, which was nice. And I, I connected L12 finally. Finally, okay. And if white knows they'll have to go back to capture in the end anyway, should they still make exchanges on the outside? Um, that's a that's a good question. Um, isn't just going back and take the loss of points better? It kind of depends. So, in this position, from a human perspective, what White has to do here in order to kill is embarrassing. Like here, then I'm gonna like play here. Like let let's follow your your suggestion here. I mean, I'm not saying it's a bad suggestion, but I'm saying that a human will never do it. First of all. If white tries to do it immediately, white's running out of liberties. So, like, white's actually gonna die. Uh, or, oh, oh, maybe white survives. Okay, okay, fine. White, white survives in this move order. So, uh, no, not in that move order. In this move order. Uh, yeah. Interestingly, if black goes down to try to Atari, white's gonna get to go down first, and then black's dumb and zumadi everywhere. So, okay, white manages this, but already, white got less than 20 points and black got everything like black got a super solid shape black already has almost 20 points just from the surplus so if white starts to go back and fill his own territory and let's black get all of these nice moves that's kind of an admission of defeat what white tried to do in the game was run out and try to live with the group separately so that he doesn't have to fill his own territory uh, and that way also, you know, there's a lot of other practical reasons to run out these groups. For example, you want to keep these two groups from connecting and making a wall together. So there's a lot of practical reasons why white doesn't want to get sealed in. Usually you'd rather not have to. So uh, what white did here was not optimal. Like, of course, it's it's not like white did the did everything perfectly here. I didn't either. But white's general philosophy was probably the only thing he could do. So white ran out. And uh, eventually, I kept harassing his groups, so I got some profit here. Then I captured this move for extra, for extra like rubbing salt in the wound. Um, and then eventually, yeah, eventually I played Q14 and I sealed in his group. I did take Gote, right? Um, but I figured it's worth it because now this is going to end up being some kind of liberty race. Uh, against my group, which means he's gonna have to fill all the all the liberties, and I also get some nice wall in the process. So I figured that there's a lot of reasons why even if I take Gote, I can I can be happy with this result. And uh, the the utility that this group offered me actually doesn't end here. This group of mine was dead the whole game, but was still useful the entire game all the way up until the end. So I mean the the game kind of uh, the game's kind of good for black right now, and uh, I think eventually I mean here uh, I think white probably thought he's behind and went a little bit crazy, but I ended up getting a good result in the fight I think. But um, yeah, this I thought was an interesting moment. Soon was white decided to try and kill my left side group. So g8 right. And if we go forward a little bit, what I found interesting was that eventually, eventually, the existence of this group still became a problem for white because it, uh, it, it was used to create a shortage of liberties in white's shape. So um, notice that, so my reading was that eventually, if white attempts to kill me locally, right? This this locally ends up in a kill. Oh no, this locally ends up in um in a seki. But okay, if white if white I'm already locally alive, but the point is that if white even tries to think of doing this, I wasn't going to just live. My intention was to let white kill me locally 
and then to throw in here, uh, which means that eventually notice that white this group of mine actually has one, two, three, four, five liberties, which means I actually win the liberty race on the top side in the end because white has to fill all of these. So uh, interestingly, while I was living on the left side, this group still became important, right? Evil plans, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and also I got a B2 bomber, yes, over here, I suppose. Um, like, uh, which is not instructive at all, but you know. Uh, oh well. So yeah, evil plans. I have to say, I really, really wanted to finish the game by killing everything. Just because... Oh, oh no problem, Nijay. I, I can't help it either. <laughs> um, anyway, so... Yeah, this was this is aside from the lecture a bit. I really, really wanted to hope that he misreads so I kill everything because I mean that way. But you know he didn't. But I that it did facilitate my living. So for me, the really nice thing about this type of zombie group is that from the moment it died to the end of the game, it was an asset for me. It was a liability for my opponent. Conversely, had white not killed it and just went about his business for the rest of the game, then it's actually a, a liability for me because I have to watch it. Like, eventually he might kill me unconditionally, right? So I have to be careful. That I think that's the really important point. So that's one of the nice things about groups. Once white spends a move to kill it, basically the burden is on white. That's the unfortunate part. So I thought I thought that this dynamic was really interesting in in our game, and I really enjoyed playing black in this position, uh, because the sacrifice of these stones just made the game so easy so easy for for me to play. Like it just the game became pleasant, you know. Um, I mean, it's not like winning the game was was easy, but like the position felt somewhat um, like it's harder for white to do anything than for me, uh, because white has to worry about this promise he made to kill the group for the rest of the game. Um, yeah, so I thought this was a cool example from a recent game of mine. Um, and the next one is a very recent example, a very topical example, uh, I guess, in the European Go scene, because um, I guess a lot of you were watching the Transatlantic Pro League, which I'll be playing in this Sunday. I'm going to, I'm going to play Ilya. Um, so, uh, rest in peace me, I suppose. But uh, last uh, last weekend was Andre versus Calvin Sun, and then was uh, Remy versus uh, versus Pavolisi, right? Oh yeah, thank you, Tateson. So, Remy versus Pavel happened. So Remy company is a six ton um, from France, and Pavel is a, a 2P, a European 2P. And they had this game, which I thought was really interesting. So, and it featured a very interesting sacrifice. So, again, I want to show a position with shocking results. Don't spoil it. Uh, uh, Pavel is black. Uh, yes, Pavel is black, yes. I mean, I, I guess a lot of you have watched it, so it's not exactly a spoiler. But, uh, okay. Um, I want to ask you guys, first of all, what do you think about this position? Pavel is black, Remy's white. Um, and in this position, obviously white died with these stones, which is what we're going to talk about, right? And white obviously has some stuff on the outside, but white did die with those stones. And the discussion... You know, while you make up your minds, I'll mention the discussion that there was around this position, which I found quite interesting. Uh, I think, for example, the commentators, Ali and Andri, said something along the lines that, I think white's fine, but I like black. and Or more like, I like black, it's like, it's easier to play black. And uh, they thought also that, like, player styles would kind of fit into... Um, fit into this as well, they said, okay, Pavel likes this type of game where he has more points, and then he disrespects the opponent influence. That's actually true. Um, Pavel's just kind of good at 
taking points, um, taking points regardless of the consequences, and then, you know, just uh, winning anyway somehow. So, you know, they they thought it's a nice, uh, a sort of nice position stylistically for black, and maybe it's easier to play for black. And I was also in chat at the time, and my impression was, well, white died with those stones, yes, but given the move order, I figured that white can't be too bad. I also, I, I thought I'd take white. I thought, I thought the game's even. I thought the game's even, so even-ish. Let's go back and check the move order, and then we can talk a little bit about why I thought the game was even-ish. Um, the pros also thought so, but they thought black's easier to play. I thought white's easier to play. So, um, the game starts off kind of normal. Pavel took points because he's Pavel. Uh, B12 is an interesting one. I don't know what to think about that result. It looks okay. And we have this situation where white's group started getting attacked. And white lived on the inside. And in this moment, I, I thought Remy did something that I quite appreciated. You know, you could just live, but that gives the opponent time to just fix the shape with a jump, right? So I thought, you know, rather than just living the stones and not considering about maximizing efficiency, Remy peeped. Which is sort of saying, well, if you fix, well, maybe now I'll make life and you can't play your magic move that fixes everything. You have to play like here, which is already much worse for your shape because you have a liberty problem with these stones, which might become interesting later. Um, so there's there's some reasons why peeping here first is actually a, a nice little detail for white that I quite liked. Uh, Pavel actually played e6. And the logic of e6 is, well, if you play this move, well, now I don't have to add an extra move. I can just capture here or do whatever I like, right? If I... If, if black had started with f6, then here, black has to add another move. So black's like, well, when you live, right, when you live, then I don't have to add another move, you know? And then white's language was, well, no, I'm not going to live, you know? Play another dame for me and, and, and kill me, you know? And uh, that's actually what happened. Black played another, invested another move to, to kill the stones. And eventually we got this position where white died with, with these stones. Uh, but black obviously has made some investment towards it, right? You wouldn't be playing dame moves such as A and B to kill stones, but I mean, you're killing stones, right? So that, that's nice. And uh, this position, I think, is kind of hard to judge. And it's kind of dynamic. Um, Again, we're talking about a zombie group situation. These stones of white, they're technically dead, but they're not going to get captured for a really long time. And we saw that these are going to be useful right up until the end of the game, you know? And that, that's a very recurring theme. When you die with stones, but they're still useful, that's a really big deal, right? There's a very big difference between getting captured cleanly and getting captured kind of, maybe, sort of, you know? Um, isn't black dead too? Black's locally dead, yes. So white can uh, white can cross cut here and start a liberty race, but this liberty race will be won by black. White's uh, white's um, group doesn't have that many extra liberties, I think. So how will it go? Um, it's probably. I'm actually wondering here. After white. Cross cuts. Black shouldn't take. Black should probably start with this move, then throw in, so that white doesn't have eyes. And then if white tries to connect or something, white's just running out of liberties. Yeah, that's much better. So black can locally die, but because black has one eye and white has no eye, then black's gonna win the race. Notice that it's still a liberty race. White can still get some center moves on the outside, so it's still a position that is. The group does lose the race, but it still has its uses. You can still get some sente moves as white. So that's that's an important distinction. Also notice that functionally, again, this group of blacks is a weak group. So there's a lot of compensation for the dead stone. 
uh, like I said during the game, I figured I'm not sure. I figured I, I preferred white because I generally like having control in a game. I like having, I like being the one with agency to do stuff. I felt like, well, black here is tied down to killing these two, so these, uh, these stones for the rest of the game, and a, lo a lot of problems. On the other hand, I figured that white taking here is incentive, for example, which means that black connecting here is going to be a little bit of a, of an annoyance shape wise. So I figured white's wall isn't that strong. And therefore, you know, there's, there's arguable, um, it's arguable that white's composition isn't too high. For me, the thing that really made it so that I thought that white should be, be like a little bit better, like I'd prefer white, is that black did play two dame, right? Black did play two dame. Like, think about it in terms of stone efficiency, black captured 20 points with two moves. And of course, capturing stones generally has other benefits, but in this case it does not, because these stones dying doesn't really give black that much more stability. Like, let's compare situations. If white had lived with these two stones, and let black, like, and let black capture here, I'm pretty sure we can say that black's actually stronger than in the game. In the game, black's weaker because he captured the stones. Notice that one of the reasons we capture stones, which is to get stronger, which is to connect our stones, which that isn't being that isn't being done here. Black's actually weaker because of the capture. Um, but okay, I I was like I wasn't sure. I like white. Now, some people in chat turned on their computers because that's what people in Twitch chat do while they're watching a TPGL. So, um, and the AI evaluation on this I found fascinating. White's plus ten. White plus ten points, um, and that that was really interesting to me because both the professionals and I, and I think most people that would be watching in the chat, were really skewed in the direction of that blacks. You know, some people. You know, I know that. Um, uh, the pros' first intuition was that they would prefer black here. Like, they were like, okay, it's it's not over or anything. White has a lot of things to do in this board. But, you know, black... I, I like black. I would rather play black, you know? Uh, oh, hello, Tykes Cooking. Um, so, uh, you missed the example about, about your game. But, uh, um, yeah, you know, I... I'm usually kind of a sucker for this type of uh, strong outside uh, outside tape. Oh, I did not. Okay, you were here. Nice. So, um, yeah, at Tyke is um, is my student. First thing is that the first example was about his game. So if anyone was there, anyway. So I kind of like this influence, but still, I didn't think white was better. You know. Um, what's dead? Something's something's gonna be dead. Yeah, so white died with these stones, right? And that's a really hard bias to get around for people. So, and by the way, the computer didn't think that white's better because white has some magic, you know, net here that, like, encloses black. The computer said black's plus 10, I checked later for myself, if white plays here, you know? <laughs> Like, white just extends with the group and does nothing, you know, and says, well, you're going to have to pull out the stones if you don't want to get netted, then I'm going to play here, white plus 10. So the added pressure on the ace stones and the fact that black played so much, so much dame is enough that white actually has a significant advantage here, according to a computer. And I found that really interesting because even stronger people, stronger players, right? The European professionals who are stronger players than, than I am. To be fair, they are in the capacity of commentators, so probably they're, uh, they're, oh wait, this is the wrong moment, of course. Um, you don't, um, you, you don't play L, L4 here because black captures, uh, sorry, black captures here, it's a move later. I, I misclicked. So white gets this exchange first, then extends, then forces black to run, then plays O3. And then, um, it's it, you know the the commentators they're commentating they're trying to make uh, the game understandable and 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 fun for an audience. I've 
you know, done game commentary myself and it's kind of hard to evaluate objectively. But nevertheless, they got this position really wrong, according to the objective, um, the objective AI opinion. And uh, Pavel, who was playing this game, I think also kind of favored the points and the capture a little bit more than he should have. And I myself also misjudged this. Everyone misjudged this. Because dying with these stones is not something that that would um is not something that we're comfortable with. Even though, if we think about it, the only thing the block hot here is 20 points for two moves for A and B. Black's actually weaker on the board to reiterate. Isn't white already starting with points like 56% win rate? But 56% win rate means white's up like half a point or something like that. And also white's up half a point if you have 7.5 Komi, black's up half a point, like black's up half a point with 6.5 Komi. This game was played with 6.5 Komi, meaning that black starts with a small advantage, right? Um, and like plus 10 points is a lot of points. Like a plus 10 lead is really high. Like th that means the computer thinks the game's over, you know? So there's a game where a pro resigns against Toshi Kun at 90% win rate. He under evaluates the influence he had after a big exchange and just resigns. Wow, that's really interesting. So yeah, that happens to people, right? So um, that happened in our first example uh, where white ended up dying with two groups of stones that they probably didn't intend to die with, right? And um, and you know re resigned, you know, arguably prematurely. And by arguably, I mean that White's up here five points, <laughs> um, nearly. So if if White gets the timing to play M fourteen, White's better. So um, yeah, that happens to people, right? And uh, I thought that this was a cool example of really high level players uh, misevaluating the situation. So um, you know, it it's a very uh, very human thing like this this bias of stones, especially of larger groups. It doesn't go away for a very long time. So, um, okay, I, I I will show quickly what happened here. I think white went went a little bit too far. White actually tried to net the black stones and connect all of his stones into like some kind of moyo, or that's what it looked like. And eventually, black ended up cutting through, and white lost most of his advantage. But then, but then black went really crazy. Pav this move by Pavel is is. I'm not going to say it's bad, but it's crazy. You have the opportunity to just capture four stones here, um, and white shape on the outside isn't even that good. But instead, black played L L6, meaning that white gets to play K4, meaning that this liberty race is still alive, and black has like 20 points fewer than he could have had. Um, but um, I mean, it's not you know, clearly like it's worse for black. I just wouldn't have thought of doing it. And the game went on in entertaining fashion, uh, I suppose. Uh, later in the game, uh, the rights, you know, White nearly died with a dragon on the right side, but White survived. And in the end, Remy, Remy did win this game. So uh, Remy uh, beat Pavel, and actually this was the second game in their two-game match. He won the first game as well. So Remy Sixton uh, beat... Um, did beat uh, a Pavel two games to zero, which was pretty nice. And I thought he played this position nicely. I mean, here, his play over here, I don't like. But his play during the sacrifice, I, I very much liked. Because it's like this, he had this drive to be efficient and not play the Dame, right? He wanted Black to play the Dame. And I, I really appreciate that. Um, there's also a game where Chochikun resigns against Lisa Dole after not finding a Tetsuji, according to AI, even position. Well, yeah, that one was... I, I've actually seen that position... It, the, the Tesuji is like really beautiful, right? That, that Tesuji is really beautiful. It's amazing. Um, but, you know, missing a Tesuji isn't the same as misevaluating a position in a way. If that Tesuji doesn't exist, then, then you know, Chachikun was in a lot of trouble. So, um, yeah. Hmm. Not as painful as the time he timed out. Well, Chochi Kun's stories to end the lecture. Um, well, okay, uh, that's that's it. Those are all the examples I prepared. Um, the conclusion that I really want to like make is that when you're evaluating positions where stones or groups might die, um, I think flexibility on this subject is very very important, right? 
Uh, I think the thing that people should really be averse to is actually having their stones taken off the board. Or, of course, sometimes your stones don't get taken off the board, but they're still useless. But my point is you have to look at how useful your stones are after they die. If you can still see uses for them, then you can actually consider sacrificing them in many situations. And that's that's the key point, the key takeaway. Right? It's not... Go isn't about whether your stones are alive or not. It's about whether you can find a way to use them or not. And whether they die is related to that, but not strictly speaking, exactly, they're not exactly the same thing. That's a really important thing that I thought was important to look at. Um, because it's something that, it's a bias that we all have and that we all have to work around when we play Go, right? Um, it's, it's one of the things that makes Go quite a, quite a beautiful game, I suppose. Um, okay, so that's, that's my conclusion for the lecture. If, if anyone has any questions on any of the positions or um, any remarks that they want to they want to throw up before the end. Um, uh, they're free to, but other than that, uh, I'll, that's um, the end for, for me. Um, that's happened to me over the board too, just spacing out for a while, then the opponent taking a lot of time to make a move. Just somehow don't notice when they play, I see. Uh, so F7 was AI approved. Yeah, I, I don't know if F7 is AI approved. I, I actually am not sure. I... It's it's me approved. For me, F7 is the only move. I don't, like, notice that black can't even kill right now because white can cut through and kill. So even if you just make the exchange and then just live, it's still good for white, you know? So this exchange has to be good. The sacrifice is still, you know, um, is still very uh, interesting later in the game. The AI liked the sacrifice for white, but I, I'm not saying that every move was perfect, you know? Uh, it's still a very... Uh... I'm sure both players made mistakes in this sequence. AI thinks e5 because black then d9 and white gets... Oh! Wants to push through here? It wants to play e5! Wow. Okay, well, uh, Papa Snack says, want to check my demo board. There's just five to ten examples. This is a topic in there. I would love to see what you think of them in human terms. I mean, you can throw the link. Um, you can throw the link in Twitch chat, and I think people can check it out. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, but uh, I, I think that's good for people to check out later. I probably won't check them on stream because that, that will take time. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's a good resource for people to check. I think... Oh, and many of them feature dying with stones. Yeah, I recommend people check this out. In many of the situations that Papastek is, is showing, um, someone dies with stones and gets some influence in return and has a good position. So it's both about appreciating influence and about being flexible about dying with stones. So, um, you know, sometimes you die with stones, but either you have more use in the future or you get enough use out of them that they can die. So it's a very good one. Thank you. Um, so, okay, I think that's um, that's probably uh, that's probably it for this lecture. Thank you to everyone for for watching. Uh, it was a fun one, and uh, yeah, I guess I guess is there anyone? Okay, I, I'm not sure if yeah, I guess we won't raid anyone. Thank you to everyone uh, for watching. Uh, we'll end it here. Uh, oh, and incidentally, check out the Nordic Dojo where I go school. If any, I'm sure a lot of students are in the chat, but some other people might not be. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, we're, we're a go school, but that's not too important. Thank you for coming. I, uh, glad you enjoyed the lecture if you did and see you next time.